Good afternoon, everybody. We've had a lot of high energy presentations just now, so I thought it would be good to take a moment to relax a bit, maybe sit up a little straighter in your chairs, you know, get comfortable, take a few deep breaths, collect your thoughts, and admire my shoes. Yes. Yes. Because they are atheist shoes. I have found incontrovertible proof of the existence of the soul right there. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. I am James Croft, and I'm going to start by telling you a story. I moved to St. Louis at the end of June to work at the Ethical Society of St. Louis, a humanist congregation in the suburbs of that Midwestern city. Here it is, with its distinctive spire. Our building is affectionately known by many in the city as the Witch's Hat. And I think you can see why. It is a stunningly beautiful building. That's our foyer and the meeting hall where we assemble every Sunday with this extraordinary spire that reaches up into the sky. This is the Ethical Society of St. Louis where I now work. And if it looks like a church, that's because in many ways it functions like one. We gather on Sundays for inspirational talks and music. We host potlucks and trivia nights and dances. We march in rallies and try to be of service to the community. We recognize the turning of the seasons and mark important holidays, like Pirate Mustache Christmas Day, like this young man is seemingly celebrating right here. We marry people, we remember our friends when we die, and welcome babies into the world. In fact, I am doing my first baby naming ceremony later this month, and I am so excited, I've decided to call him James. <laughs> Actually, I don't get to choose the names of the babies, sadly. The position that I'm training for is ethical culture leader. That's our equivalent of clergy, and I will perform many of the same functions of a religious clergy person in a traditional religion, except without the magic hat or the magic underwear or magic anything at all. Our community exists to provide a safe home for humanists, to inspire ethical living, and to promote humanist values in the world. We are a godless congregation. Our core value is the equal dignity of all people. And every Sunday, a member of our Sunday Ethical Education for Kids program stands on a box so that they can see over the podium and reads a statement of our community's values, which begins, every person is important and unique. Every person deserves to be treated fairly and kindly. That's why I left Boston and Harvard, where I'd studied for seven years, and moved to St. Louis, one of those places, like the question I was asking, which is not so open to secular perspectives as Massachusetts was. Less than two months after I arrived in St. Louis, Michael Brown, an unarmed black teenager, was shot by Darren Wilson, a white police officer, and killed. And the city exploded, not with violence, as you may think from the media. Any violence was short-lived and very limited in scale, but with activism. Overnight, St. Louis became the center of a new national movement against racism. And I felt immediately that I and my community had to do something about it, because if the humanist commitment to the equal dignity of all people is to mean anything at all, then it has to mean that people of color can expect their lives to matter to police as much as white lives do, right? So I began working and going to meetings with local activists who were part of what was quickly becoming a large and well-organized protest movement in that city. And through those meetings, I connected with the Black Lives Matters movement, and it gave me many opportunities for activism. And what I'm going to do now is show you some photos, most of which I took myself, of various protests and events that we've been doing over the past few months to give you a sense of the vibrancy and creativity and passion of this movement. The first thing I did was walk in the first major national march 
on Ferguson. We began by the burnt out quick trip that you may have seen on the news. It was a convenience store that was destroyed in the violence in the first few days following the shooting. And then we marched together down to the site of Michael Brown's death. There were hundreds of people chanting and singing and marching. And by the time we reached the street where Brown was shot, the line of marchers stretched as far as I could see. This is the memorial to Michael Brown, built by family, friends, and a shocked community. And on that day, around it on the ground, you could still see the bloodstains. People stood in a ring around that little mound of flowers and toys and candles and messages and paid their respects to someone most had never met. Later, the protests moved downtown. A call went throughout the country to march on the seat of city government, and groups from around America heeded it. We had religious groups, a lot of them, and political groups. Here are the socialists marching with us. And here is our small contingent of proud humanists. One of the most powerful images for me from that march was this enormous puppet of Michael Brown, his hands raised in the symbol that came to symbolize these protests, hands up, don't shoot. We got lucky and we were positioned behind the puppet in, our, in the parade. You can see the symbol of our society in blue just behind the puppet in that image. I also did a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work with local area clergy. And these orange vests that you're gonna see in a lot of the photos that follow became the de facto garb of activist clergy in St. Louis. They say clergy on the back. And you began to see them all around the city. Now as a humanist and atheist, working alongside clergy has sometimes made me uncomfortable. But I wanted to make it clear that we atheists do have something to say about the great moral issues of our time. So I went to a lot of clergy planning meetings, worked in a lot of churches, sat, yes, in a lot of prayer circles, and learned from rabbis and priests and imams. And these clergy are some of the most principled people I have ever known, willing to be pounded by rubber bullets, choked by tear gas, and arrested for their beliefs. Religion doesn't poison everything. This photo was taken not by me at a protest in which a very large group of clergy positioned themselves in front of the police station and got themselves arrested in a mass movement in order to make the statement that their lives mattered no more than the black people who are being killed in the streets all around the country. This Next photo is one that I didn't take too. It's from another clergy protest, which I participated in, in which we took over a series of streets blocking traffic for several minutes and over a period of hours. I didn't take this one because you can actually see me in the back left of the image standing up, not kneeling down to pray. <laughs> My, yes, well, you can applaud for that if you like. My enthusiasm for interfaith activism only goes so far. During these protests, police misconduct was everywhere. They were overly aggressive, turning up in riot gear and armored cars at the slightest provocation. They fired rubber and wooden bullets into crowds of peaceful protesters, sometimes causing astonishing wounds. In one terrifying incident recorded by human rights observers from Amnesty International, including some of my personal friends, like Rachel, who's the person with the pink gas mask in that picture, a group of peaceful protesters was prevented from leaving an established sanctuary space as police fired tear gas canisters into the building. Amnesty International recorded the incident from inside, tweeting images like this of protesters with red eyes and mucus streaming down their face as the gas fills the room in the background. It was horrifying. And things like that happened again and again and again. It was clear that in the eyes of the police, the protesters were the enemy, not citizens they had sworn to serve and protect not their employers, but the enemy. 
The last actual protest I went to was on Christmas Eve, a candlelit vigil in response to the death of Antonio Martin in St. Louis, another black teenager who was shot and killed by a white cop. It was held on the steps of the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis during their midnight mass, and it was a call to peace and respect of all people. Well, I said it was held on the steps of the cathedral, but actually it had to be held on the sidewalk because the cathedral staff shooed us off the steps and called in the riot police. Yes, on Christmas Eve, one of the largest Catholic cathedrals in America decided to place a police line between itself and peaceful vigil keepers upholding the dignity of all people. How's that for Christian charity? I love this last photo from the, that protest. White silence equals violence. I know after my participation in the protests over the past few months in St. Louis that I was silent on this issue for far too long. Now, in case you're still trapped in the idea that many people are, that the Black Lives Matter movement is essentially about one case, about Darren Wilson and Michael Brown and what did or did not happen on that street. I, I want to take a moment to give you a broader perspective. Fundamentally, this is a matter of dignity. The Black Lives Matter movement is a call to all of us to recognize and accept that people of color in the United States are not treated as fully dignified human beings. Not, thankfully, in the same way as during the time of slavery and segregation. Progress has been made. But in countless ways, in every aspect of our lives, the message is conveyed that black people are less worthy of ethical respect than white people. Their lives don't matter as much as mine. This is not a theory. And I say this not as an expression of white guilt or because I'm a race traitor or because I'm either a Nazi or a Jewish overlord. All things I've been called by other atheists as I have become more visible talking about this issue. I say this because it is an unavoidable social fact, an uncomfortable, challenging, dispiriting, disturbing, disgusting, outraging fact that in today's America, black lives do not matter as much as white lives. Our society conveys this in a million ways, and all you need to do to know that it's true is listen to what people of color tell us about their experience of living here in America. One example which has stuck with me coming out of my work in the aftermath of Ferguson was an event that we hosted at the Ethical Society in which a panel of black mothers talked about their experience of raising black sons. Their descriptions offer a window into a world that I, as a white man with no children, had never encountered before. And I want to share with you some of what those mothers said. For black mums, there comes a time when your cute little boy gets to a certain height and is perceived as a threat. I'm so heart weary of our boys always fitting the description. I don't sleep until he gets home, said one mother of a 20-year-old son. I have not slept all night since my son was about 10 years old. You may not be like your best friend, like little boys who are not black boys. When you're out, no more than one boy. Three is a mob, three is a gang. I don't know where we can move where you don't have to take this. This is everywhere for you. It's very difficult to tell your child, this is the world and it's ugly. Mommy, I just wanna know how long this will last, asked one boy to his mother after being stopped on the street by police on his way home from school. He was 12 years old. And what did his mother feel compelled to reply? Forever. It will last forever. That's what this is about. 
the racism that infects our criminal justice system and every other system in this country doesn't just manifest itself in overt acts of violence and discrimination. It asserts itself through thousands and thousands of small indignities like the ones these mothers describe, which progressively affect the psyche and the soul. The Black Lives Matter movement is a response to the fact that in today's America, black lives matter less than white lives. So why talk about this at an atheist convention? What does this have to do with atheism? Well, one reason to talk about it is that our movement is conspicuously white. Looking around the hall today and speaking with people over the past couple of days, I see very few people of color. And one reason for that is that we rarely address issues of race directly in our conventions, communities, and student groups. While the atheist community seems reasonably comfortable talking about issues that face the LGBTQ community, and I'm grateful for that, and has recently been forced to begin to address its problems with sexism, race is infrequently on our agenda. We spend a lot of time discussing religious oppression, very little time talking about the oppression of people of color. And this is reflected in our institutional priorities. Over the past few months in St. Louis, I've noticed that organized atheism tends to be conspicuously absent in coalitions seeking to address racial injustice. And this is a pattern which is replicated across the country. And the same, interestingly, can't be said of most religious groups. They are mostly represented. It's not that we are in an inactive community. Organized atheism is actually very activist. It's just that we've decided to focus our attention on one narrow slice of social issues at the expense of others. So when our spokespeople go on television, I expect they might have something to say about secular government or teaching evolution in schools, but I'm surprised if they mention criminal justice reform or demilitarizing the police. So one reason to discuss what's happening in Ferguson right now is that we just don't talk about race enough as a movement. A response to that critique that I frequently hear goes something like this. Racism has nothing at all to do with atheism. I see this sort of argument on blogs and in comment sections and on Twitter and YouTube comments. Atheism, people say, simply means not believing in God, nothing more. It doesn't commit me to social justice or liberalism, just atheism. We shouldn't split the community by introducing these side issues. We must focus on our core priorities like separation of church and state. I hear arguments like that all the time. And I can't deny that those arguments have a certain sparse appeal because it's true technically that atheism simply means not believing in God. It's true too that simply being an atheist does not necessarily commit you to any moral stance whatsoever. It's logically consistent to be an atheist and a sexist, an atheist and a homophobe, and yes, an atheist and a racist. Those are logically consistent. As we heard from Dave this morning, you can even be an atheist and a conservative if you want. <laughs> but beyond this thin intellectual appeal, that argument is, as we philosophers say, and this is a technical term, total bullshit. <laughs> because just as being an atheist doesn't necessarily commit you to anti-racism, neither does it necessarily commit you to separation of church and state, or real science education in schools, or even opposing religious bigotry. If atheist just means that you lack a belief in God, then none of our favorite political causes follows directly from it. Yet you never hear the critics of social justice atheism complaining about our support for secular government or teaching about evolution. So the only conclusion that I can draw from this is that what these people mean when they say atheism has nothing to do with social justice is I don't want atheism to have anything to do with social justice. <laughs> or, right, or perhaps it's more like I don't want to have anything to do with social justice. And that is a fundamentally self-serving position. I'm going to risk getting myself in trouble, but what, what's life without a little risk? 
There's something I've heard Dave Silverman say a number of times at conventions and recently again on that CNN special on atheism. He says that if you're asked what your religious beliefs are and you reply humanist instead of atheist, that's a cop out. And on the CNN special, he actually said such people are lying. Now, before Dave gets angry with me, and he has a fearsome temper, so I have to be careful, I want to say that I totally understand what he means by this. I know where he's coming from. He wants people to use the term atheist in order to break the stigma around it, and he doesn't want people to use humanist as a softer sounding word when they really mean atheist. And that is fair enough. I totally agree with him. That does sound like a bit of a cop out. Atheists suffer significant social stigma in this country, and we should all work to end that. And avoiding the term atheist is not going to help. And that's one reason I love my atheist shoes so much. I am a proud atheist, and I am very open about it. But there is another form of cop-out that I see far too much in our atheist community, and that is using the term atheist as a way to excuse yourselves from issues of social justice, as if being an atheist absolves you of any social responsibilities at all, except the ones you feel comfortable taking on, the ones that affect you the most. Using your atheism as an excuse to avoid your ethical responsibilities, that is the ultimate cop-out. As much as I'm proud to be an atheist and to serve a godless congregation, I know that the great questions of life are not answered when you arrive at, the, at atheism, at the belief that God doesn't exist. They begin there. Once you recognize there is no God, no scriptural or divine guidance for your actions, then you have to begin to ask the question, how will I now live? What values will guide my life? Atheism alone is not enough to answer those questions. So to all of you here today, congratulations for recognizing that God does not exist, genuinely. For many people, that's a difficult struggle. And in this country, many have to resist huge social pressures to accept our own atheism and be proud of it. That's something to celebrate this weekend. I, as an inspiring, humanist clergy person, give you my blessing. <laughs> but I'm sorry to tell you that that was the easy part. Now the difficult part, deciding which values will guide our lives in a godless universe, begins. And I want to suggest that one thing we can do is work together to fight racism. Racism is not our fault. We didn't create the system we're living in, but it is our responsibility. And if we want to think of ourselves as humanists, as I think we should, as people who champion the dignity of every person on this planet, then we all have to take responsibility for eradicating racism. And I believe we can make a difference now. The Black Lives Matter movement is already making a difference. Now, all across the country, whenever a person of color is killed by police, people take to the streets. That didn't happen before. Most of the unarmed people of color killed by police were anonymous, nameless, until this movement changed that. Now people are going to know the names. They're going to know the names of Michael Brown and Antonio Martin and Eric Garner. This movement did that already. It's already shifted the register of the public debate about race. And we atheists can be a part of shifting it further. How? I have three rules that I've tried to use to guide my work in St. Louis, and I've certainly applied them imperfectly, but this is what I try and do. Show up, shut up, and keep up. First, show up. Find events, groups, organizations in your area working for the emancipation of people of color and see if they're willing to let you attend. Attend rallies and protests on issues affecting the black community. Get out of your comfort zone and be visible as atheist groups and individuals in spaces which are majority black. Show up. Second, shut up. This is the hardest one for me. The work is not about us. It's not primarily about atheism. And if you're a white guy like me, you shouldn't seek to be a leader or spokesperson of this movement. Take a back seat, learn from black leaders, 
listen to what they want you to do. That's very, very difficult for many white people to do. I like to be the center of attention. It's very, very difficult for me to do. But if you want to work alongside others for freedom, you have to know when to follow. Follow the leadership of people of color. Listen to what they tell you. For atheists, this will mean sometimes working with and taking direction from religious leaders. And that's okay. This is not about us. Become comfortable working in religious coalitions to achieve broader goals. And third, keep up. There's a tendency for outside groups, and I've been working against this with our society, to swoop in for a photo shoot at the rally and never be seen again. There's some of this in the atheist movement's approach to LGBTQ issues. We table up pride, but do nothing for the rest of the year. Don't do that. Keep up your commitment to the struggle and work for long-term change. Let's keep educating ourselves about the issues facing people of color in America so we can keep fighting. Don't let's swoop in and out when it suits us. If we can turn up, shut up, and keep up, we will not only be agents for genuine change in America, but we will gain the respect and support of those we fight alongside and promote the atheist cause in America in an ethical way. So I have a vision for you, a vision of the atheist movement and what we could become. To those of you who consider yourselves free thinkers, I say this, we should be the ones who understand power and privilege the best. We shouldn't be arguing against each other about whether racism exists or whether sexism is a thing or whether homophobia is real. We should be focusing all our intellectual energy, all the tools of our rationalism to try to find systemic solutions. We should be the best students of society and its most passionate teachers. What if we took all the energy we expend arguing about whether God exists? Isn't the answer rather obvious? And poured it into activism in service of humankind. What if instead of hosting a debate between William Lane Craig and Richard Dawkins, because honestly, haven't we seen enough of those already? I've watched about 50 of those. What if we put the same money and time into putting together a panel on prejudice and oppression and to learn what we can do about it? What if instead of wringing our hands about why there's no people of color in our groups, we got out there and marched with them in the streets? What if atheists, right? What if atheists were known on college campuses and local communities around the country as people who would stand up whenever injustice and oppression threatens our fellow human beings? What if we became champions of dignity? That would be a movement I would be proud to serve. So the question I want to leave you with this weekend is, who do we want to be as a movement? Do we want to be like those brave clergy I was working with, willing to put our bodies on the line, get arrested, dragged across the ground, beaten for our fellow citizens? Or do we want to be like that Catholic cathedral, standing on the side of injustice, walling ourselves off from the world and its problems? Are we going to say, I'm just an atheist, that's not my problem? Or are we going to look beyond our atheism and find reasons to work in solidarity with others. In the words of one of those black mothers at our Mother to Mother event, we've created this society we now live in. This is our problem. The good people gotta stop hiding. Let's be the good people. Let's stop hiding. Let's be champions of dignity. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.